guys doing today? Okay. All right, well, welcome again to 161. How are we doing back there? All right, great. This is officially lecture number one. And what is the subject of this lecture? To, telling a story. And it is, I need a, first of all, we need to send around a sheet where we identify that you guys are here. So could we have a sheet of your paper? Yeah. Actually, two of your sheets of your paper. And here you go. We're going to send this sheet around to make sure that you are here today. And your name is what? Bridget. Bridget identified that the point of today's lecture is what? <laughs> Telling a story. That is correct. Um, now I want to start off, and I told you that there were five things that you were going to learn from this class, and I want to go back to that list. Always review can be good. And I forgot an essential element of it, okay? So this, again, I would tattoo these on my arm if I was you. If you want to be a writer, you need to know these things, all right? So before we get into story straight up, I would say number one, what is the first thing we will learn? Yes, sir? What will your boss say? What's your name? Nick. Nick is correct. What will your boss say? When you ask us, can I turn a paper in late? We will say, we will say, what will your boss say? When you say, and we're reasonable about this, okay? I mean, you know, your boss is going to be reasonable to some extent too, but what would your boss say? A professional paradigm is what we use for this class. What is the second thing you're going to learn? Yes, sir. When in doubt, check the AP book out. And I intentionally brought a version today from 2006. And at the top it says, the Bible of the newspaper industry. Now they quit putting that on the cover. But this is the Bible. If I want to know how to abbreviate Arizona, I'm going to look in this book. If I want to know how to refer to the Pope for my print article, I'm going to look at this book. When in doubt, check the book out. What was the third thing that we were... Oh, and what was your name? Chris. Uh, yes, the third, third thing. Yes, sir. Always tell a story. That's right. And what is your name? Sam. Sam is correct. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Right? Tell a story. We like stories. And we'll get that in today. What's the fourth thing that we learned? Yes, ma'am. Know your structural considerations. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And we'll talk more about it on Monday. But what is your name? Ida. What is that? Ida. Ida. Excellent. Thank you, Ida. We're always going to think about structural considerations. The fifth thing, ma'am? Quality writing. What are the characteristics of quality writing? And what are they? Yes? Clear, concise, correct, and complete. And um, that you that offered the answer, what's your name? Stephanie. And what is your name? Dana. And I, you know, I, I'm going to ask that you guys sit in those similar places and I'll do the best I can. The sixth thing I need to add is revise, rewrite, repeat. Number six, revise, rewrite, repeat. Now, I, how many people have this textbook? All right, you need this textbook. This went through at least everything in here, went through each chapter, went through 10 revisions. Then we sent it to the publisher for the first edition. A professional editor spent 40 hours a work week getting paid to edit this book. Then, UPS students read the first edition and sent me emails where there were mistakes, and there were mistakes, and you got extra credit for it. Then we read it again, and we rise it again. This book has been edited 35 times by professional students. I said chapters to people that work at the Panagraph, but... And I use this as an indicative example. Remember, I'm going to share a lot of stuff with you, but I do not think I'm all that. I'm fat. I'm slow. I'm not all that. But I do have experiences. But, and I don't mind identifying, am I the best writer I'm ever going to be? No, I am not. So someone emailed me. Who was that? He, yes. Andrew? Yes. Andrew found a mistake. Did you not? 
Yeah, and what page was that? Was it 19, Andrew? Nine. And he sent me an email, and there, um, on page nine, if you have it, how many people have it? Turn to page nine. <laughs> That's right. Check it out. On page nine, if you look, about one-fourth of the way down is the word correct. Do you see that in bold? Now look up. And then the whole sentence says, you want to be concise so you can fit your message into the spot for which you paid, you paid. <laughs> Am I the best writer I'm ever going to be? No. So, <laughs> what's that? Nah, yeah, I guess I could buy that. And again, I, I should know your name. Summer. Um, did you ever see the 500 Days of Summer? It's awesome, isn't it? Oh, and it's got you, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. What a dish he is, right? <laughs> okay, there you go. Anyways, he's going to be the next Batman, too. So, it, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Yeah, he's Robin. No, he's Robin, but, but he's, he took over the Batcave. We'll see. Okay, we'll see what they want to do. My point, though, is summer, I could explain it and give some rationale, but the bottom line is it's a mistake. If I can make a mistake after people reading my stuff 35 times, do you think you can? What's the answer for that, then? Subtract eight points. Oh, yes. And 16 if it was a proper noun, but you'll, you're going to cover that in your lab. But what do I need to do, then? Raise your hand. Come on. Well, friends did read it, but it still got through. Okay, I mean, the baby's mama read it, students read it, assistants read it, colleagues read it, people in the industry read it. Two different editors were paid by Kendall Hunt for 40 hours a week. Their job was to read it, and they missed this. You, you, you hear what I'm saying? It's never perfect. Okay, so I revise, rewrite, and repeat. That's what I should have done. Say revise, rewrite, repeat. And that's number six, is it not? This is the takeaway. When you go to the next class and other classes, you remember these six things. Do you understand that? You're going to go into PR classes. You're going to remember these six things. When you go into your journalism classes, into news writing, into print, you're working for the Vedette. You're working for TV10. You're working for WZND. You're going to apply these six things. And the, that last one may very well be the most important one. Revise, rewrite, and repeat. Because if I can make a mistake... I mean, I'm going to quote Ernest Hemingway. I don't like to curse. Well, maybe I do, but Ernest Hemingway said the first draft of anything is shit. And uh, sometimes the uh, 28th version is still kind of stinky. So, so revise, rewrite, and repeat. Those are the six things, and you're going to learn those. We're going to internalize them through the semester, and then you're going to take that to your future PR classes, and you're going to apply those six things. Are you not? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, so you should have this book, and you will definitely need it for Friday. Um, on Friday, you're going to meet in your individual labs. You're going to look at the appendix. You and your lab instructor, big time. It's where it clearly identifies your responsibilities and role in this, roles in this class. You also need to bring a syllabus. And by way of a little bookkeeping, we have updated the syllabus. We just uploaded a new version this afternoon. You need to reprint it up, okay? Because we made some minor changes. Again, the idea is revise, rewrite, and repeat, right? And if I'm asking you to do that, we had to do that, and we did that with the syllabus today. And again, when I was at the seminary freshman year of high school, Father Gary Jarvis said, thinking people change their minds. So it's all tentative. Oh, what's that? Oh, yeah, thinking people change their minds. I said people. <laughs> okay, okay, summer. Women. That's right. Um, as Katie, Katie sings, you change your mind like a girl changes clothes, right? Anyways, my point is that we will continue to hone the syllabus, but you need to upload the latest syllabus and take it to your lab on Friday. Is that clear to everybody? All right.
Now, there was another, the second procedural thing I do want to do before that I get into the meat of the class is I want to draw your attention to this wonderful little book. Somebody emailed me and said it wasn't available. I immediately, look, nobody respects your opinion, your questions on this campus more than I do. I will try to respond to every email as soon as possible. And as a matter of fact, you're required to email me once during the course of the semester. You'll cover that on lab on Friday, but I need you to email me. Tell me the good, cool movie you're watching. Tell me you like Breaking Bad this week. <laughs> Okay, freetv.com. Okay, I, don't, I, I understand. I like to go in fresh. And last semester, I got busted. Some people complained I gave away the end. So I'll stop right now, all right? But tell me you like the episode. Tell me you like Trailer Park Boys. Tell me what you like. I don't care. Email me your shoe size. size. You're required to email me twice during the course of the semester. Does everybody understand that? Write it down. I must email Mikhail twice during the course of the semester. And I will try to respond to that email as soon as possible. Who emailed me and said this wasn't available? Who was it? Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Because when I got that, I said, what's your name? Thanks, John. I got on the phone with Alamo because I had gotten this in the FedEx like two days ago. And they have it on the shelves. Okay, good. All right, great. Um, and what I think is I, I kind of asked you and suggested you might take. Did you look at the introduction? Yeah. Okay. And what is the, how many, those people that got it and took a look at the introduction, what does it say this book is? This book here. Crafting messages in a multimedia, a multimodal media environment. Yes, ma'am. It's to work with that book. Convergent Media, you get my take on, on writing media. In this book, you get the take from professionals who have worked in the field. From prof sure, is your name Joe? Sam, sorry Sam, Sam Gamgee. Try to remember. Sam, what, 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 what kind of, what's your major? Broadcasting. Broadcasting. So you're gonna take Laura Trendopolis maybe. You have it right now. She wrote a chapter in here about writing television news. Deb bless her. How many people study with her? There's a chapter in here from her about radio writing radio news. And they're going to be guest lectures. And what this does is give us another perspective. Okay? And it augments what we already do. Now the other thing that the intro does is it gives you a sense of the scope of this class. I mean, one of the reasons we're using this textbook is there is no textbook out there that covers the range of what we're covering. I mean, this starts with print, straight print, then feature print, then radio news, television news. Court Wright and Smoody have an excellent article on public relations. It has viral video, a chapter on viral video, social um, network, writing, um, writing feature films, writing documentaries, and a variety of other things. So it gives you the, an idea of the full range of this course, okay? This is like, this course is designed for you to see a whole bunch of different types of media writing and decide where you might want to go in your future. It also introduces you to your professors and the lines. If you decide to go to PR, it gives you the basics and then develops your ability to write for PR. Develops your basics so then you can then go write for Laura Trendle Polis and be in TV 10. Do you guys understand? And at this point, you might not know what kind of writing you want to go into. So this gives you a taste of a variety so that you can decide later what kind of writing it is that you want to do. Does that make sense? All right. Now, let's then go to the beginning chapter. And I guess I asked you to read the front matter in this book, right? Convergent Media Writing. I ask you to take a look at it. Um, what did you get a sense about the introduction? First, the preface. There is the word that I introduced the class with, right? Arete, which means what? Ba ju Sam. To reach. To become better. And I'm never going to be the best I can be, but, I, but a virtuous person, according to the ancient Greeks, always tries to improve. I'm not perfect, but I tr perfectly try my best to become better. 
And that's the point of this class. Then it goes through and it talks about how we're going to de deal with a range of mass media and we're going to have professional standards. And I say in there that you're not going to like it in the midst of this class. You're going to be like, they are so hard. But you're going to appreciate it when you go to your advanced classes. When you're at your internship and your, your boss says, you're doing a really good job. You know, you need to apply for a job here later on. Which is exactly what happened to Tyler Streeter. I went and visited. I was in L.A. He was an intern at Universal. He got me in. I got a backstage pass like a golden ticket. I got to go to a, like, executives were watching Pitch Perfect. And I got to go like six months before it came out. And he was a great intern. And he did, took a number of classes with me. Now he's an employee of Universal Pictures in Hollywood. That can be you. Whatever you want to do, you can do it if you do your best. Okay? I promise. All right? But you're going to have to challenge yourself to rise to rigorous professional standards. All right? And then it kind of gives an overview of the book. A lot of people help me with this book, students included. But then we really get to the meat. Lecture one, chapter one, telling a good story. And we saw in that intro, um, that is a clip from the film Adaptation, written by Mr. Kaufman, Charlie Kaufman. And he won an Academy Award, I think, for Eternal Spotless... What? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless What is it, sir? Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And in this mind bender, he's wanting to write about irises, the iris thief, but he doesn't want to write a traditional story. And that teacher is McKee. And I've had the privilege of being able to study. The, it was an actor playing McKee, but I got to study under McKee. And he is just like that. Can I quote him for one second? I would never say this to students. But I remember him starting his lecture. He said, if you don't like me cussing, there's the fucking door. And again, I'm just quoting him, okay? I didn't really cuss. I just quoted him, okay? So, but, it, but the point is, I would encourage everybody to go on YouTube and look at McKee in adaptation to look at that essence. He's a story's going on every day. Today, someone's going to betray his best friend for a woman. There's a woman being beaten on the street with a crowbar. There is people, people's careers are rising and falling. There's people that are dying in the streets. Those are stories, journalism, and they're covered by the newspapers. They're covered in the radio. They're covered on television. Some of those have to do with PR. What is the politician going to do? How is his PR person going to explain that he betrayed his best friend and while his wife had cancer, that John Edwards was having a sexual relationship with someone on his staff? That's public relations, isn't it? And it's got to do with the story. Documentaries are all about stories. You're, the television, we're going to deal with television series, man. I'm watching right now. I think it's, I can't stop watching it. I got to hang out under a tree for an hour with Ewan McGregor. He's Obi-Wan Kenobi, okay? I'm in the hills of Oklahoma hanging out with him. But he's got this great series I just got turned on to called The Long Way Round, where him and a buddy drive a motorcycles around the world. And it's a story. And I'm buying it as entertainment, man. I mean, I I also like Orange is the New Black. I've been watching the Hatfields and the McCoys, too. I'm, I don't know. I, it, it's on Netflix. If you got, you know, it's what is available on Netflix is kind of what I'm watching lately. All those are good stories, right? Argo, a good story. Um, Hugo, a good story. Uh, the, the, what, uh, what's the movie about the guy that was with the tiger on the ship? <laughs> Life of Pi is a good story. We like good stories. No matter what kind of mass media you write, you want to tell a good story. That's what will separate you from the rest. You could just give the facts of your PR about Apple and all how good things are. But if you tell us a story about jobs, you put a face to the, to the company and you tell us a story. It makes it so much more interesting. So we're talking about telling a story. 
And I will say initially then, we're going to talk about thinking dramatically, structural considerations, mass media writer as storytellers, and then we're going to synthesize this stuff. The first thing I want to say is Dr. Casale, when I got my degree at NYU, New York University, he said, John, you need to think dramatically. Think as a dramatist. And when I think as a dramatist, I have these elements within my, um, my writing, in my story. Okay, now here, everybody look at me for a second. Everybody look at me. I do not want you to write everything that's down on this, this, this screen. I want you to write one of the things, then we'll talk about it. Then you write the next thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so let's say we are right, thinking dramatically. The first word we write is what? <laughs> Protagonist. Write that word down. Now let's define it. Don't write the next thing, okay? What is a protagonist according to the text? Every story has one. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Stephanie's absolutely right. It's the main character. They make decisions that move the story forward. You, what's that? Pardon? Frodo Baggins is an example. Frodo Baggins, a definitely example. What's that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Frodo is, are uh, we talking, Frodo, help me out. Is he, Lord of the Rings, yeah, man, he gets the ring. He's got to get rid of it. He'll give it to anybody. Do not dare me, Baggins, right? He tries to get a Gandalf. He tries to give it to the elf princess. She just, ah, no, nobody wants it. He's got to get rid of it, and that's his will or want, isn't it? To get to the Mount Doom, is that what it's called? And get that sucker in the lava. Even if it happens, I don't want to give away the end, do I? <laughs> All right, he gets killed halfway through the very first movie at the end. <laughs> they call it the weed. They grow the best weed in the Shire. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Woody, well, Woody's asking me, can you blow smoke rings like, like Gandalf? And I'm like, Gandalf didn't roll smoke rings. He blew ships. And then he was like, oh, yeah. But anyways, definitely he's a protagonist. Now, the protagonist is usually a good guy, but not always. I think of... Uh, Man, where he turned um, into an yeah, man, Heisenberg, is Walter White a good guy? Well, he may have been at the beginning, but when he let Jesse's girlfriend choke on her own vomit to death. Spoiler alert! I mean, it was in, it was in season three, okay? Oh, you guys don't want me to give away the, the end of Wizard of Oz? You haven't seen it yet? <laughs> I mean, you got to cut me some slack here. But who remembers that moment? That's when he became bad. I think he lost his soul right there, man. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we can debate it. Uh, what, what about Tony, Tony Montana? First you get the money, then you get the power, then you get the women. This is Scarface. How many people have seen it? He's not a good guy, but he is the protagonist, isn't he? Because he makes, like Stephanie said, he makes the choices that move the story forward. All right? What is the second thing we are now going to write down? Will or want. Our protagonist has a will or want. Ewan McGregor's got a desire to drive that motorcycle around the world. Andy Dufresne, what was his will or want in Shawshank Redemption? Get out of jail. Bilbo Baggins, what is his will or want? Get rid of the freaking ring. Um, uh, hangover, what's the, what's the will or want? They need to find Dougie, 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 right? And they need to find the right Doug, not the black Doug with the roofies. They need to find their friend Doug who's getting married, right? They have a will or want. Every great story has a will or want, okay? And that is something, somebody tell me what a will or want is in your own words. Yes, ma'am. What they're desiring to do. I mean, uh, Ben Affleck in Argo, he wants to get those people out of Iran, right? Um, in A Life of Pi, this guy just, he wants to not get eaten by the tiger and he'd like to live, right? Every story has a protagonist that has some will or want, okay? Now, the set, third thing here is what? Where they accept their will and want. John is right. It's when they recognize their will and want and then recognize how hard it's going to be. Frodo recognizes he's got to get rid of that ring, but it's going to be a long haul, man. They're dealing with ring wraiths. He needs 
Sam Gamgee's help, doesn't he? And then I don't know if Mary and Pippin help anybody really, but well, inevitably they do, right? Mary and Pippin each play their own role. I mean, what if they didn't get the ants, right? Don't you love that line? The further from danger you are, the closer to harm you'll be. And that didn't even make any sense. But the ants like, you're so small, you must be smart. So, okay, cool. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody who, who saw that, I'm not giving it away. What's an ant? A giant tree. Remember, they took on Sauron's whole business. They tore down that, if that didn't happen, the whole Middle Earth may have gone bad. Everybody played their role, okay? Um, but the realization by Frodo, I can't do this alone. That's why you need the Fellowship of the Ring, right? Um, Argo, Ben Affleck, he realizes what he's got to do, but he knows he needs the help of Hollywood, good men, right? How many people saw Argo? A few of you, you know what I'm talking about. He realizes what he's got to do, but he knows that bicycles driving a turkey ain't going to do it. Right? Did you see it? Okay, well you need to. It's the best, it's the best picture of last year. How are we getting? Audio coming through good? Excellent. Um, so there's a realization by the main character of what they're willing on and how hard it is going to be. Now there comes a point of the major dramatic question, which is just, will they achieve it? Will Frodo get destroy the ring? Or is Sauron going to get it? Right? Did you see Lord of the Rings? Okay. What movie have you seen recently? Uh, oh, this is the end. Excellent. Are they going to all die and go to hell? Or are they going to live and go to heaven? Right? Isn't that their question? Are we going to live? And Franco's almost going to make it. And then he's like... And he gets pulled back down. This is really, I think, it's a hilarious movie. Right? Yeah, yeah, but they have a will and want, which is to live through the apocalypse, and then ultimately they realize they want to go to heaven so they can see, what, the Backstreet Boys? <laughs> what? Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'll work on it. What's that? You'll be sitting there telling the whole thing. <laughs> no. All right, all right, I'm going to work on it. Look, I'm not perfect. I'm not seeing this as the end. <laughs> All right. Well, some of them, <laughs> you know, I didn't say who does what, did I? You don't know what happens to Jonah Hill. Ah! <laughs> How many people saw this is the end? You know what I'm talking about. Anyways, uh, I didn't give away who lives, who dies, whatever, okay? So I'll try to do better on that. But they have a will and want, don't they? And, uh, and they, the dramatic question is that. Will Andy Dufresne get out of jail? That's the dramatic question, right? Yes or no? Will Frodo get rid of the ring? Will Luke Skywalker, will the rebellion take over the evil empire? Right? What? I don't want to give it away! I don't want to give it away, do I? How many people... That's tough. Look, I, I want to, what is it called? A Statue of Limitations. If the movie's older than 20 years, I get to give away the ending, okay? Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, okay, but you get the point. Will they find Dougie, 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 right? It's answer the affirmative or negative. Now, as they try to answer the dramatic question, hey, hey, can I have your attention? They face complications. What are complications? Yes. Very good. Complications are obstacles or complications. Complications are obstacles or impediments that, that prevent them from reaching their goal to, in their effort to answer the dramatic question in an affirmative way and to get their will and want. And in Hangover 2, what are the complications? Being hungover. Being hungover that's a good start. Blackouts, that's always a complication. A baby in, a tiger in the bathroom, yes. A baby in the closet, yes. Would you bring us a car? It's a cop car, what? Right? They got that little guy, the little Chinese fight. He'll take a news, you little Never mind. <laughs> yeah, Tyson. They stole Tyson's tiger and then they took a whiz in his swimming pool, right? I mean, these are complications. What are the complications for Frodo? Uh, what does it have? Ring raids. Golem. Golem. 
Smeagol. That's right. Um, there's all kinds of complications. They try to go in the front way, and they're oh, we, oh, like a oh, we, oh, and then Smeagol's like, oh, I can do the back way, my precious, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's just like the Wizard of Oz to me. Well, where, where, what is Dorothy's complications? <laughs> yeah, man. She, yeah, she, she wants to get home, and she hooks up with these three friends, and they walk across this poppy field, which is really heroin, and they all, remember, they fall asleep? But Glenda sends down the, the snow so that they get, don't, they're not high anymore, and then they, then they get to the wizard, like, get me home. And he's like, no, you've got to get her broomstick. Who saw the great and powerful Oz? Okay, well, the kids and I kind of liked it. And, and, and the ending, never mind. <laughs> Complicated. Andy Dufresne, right? We talked about it. He's got the warden. He's got, um, you know, the sisters. Is that what they're called? He's got the, the, some guy that's got the truth who could get him out, get shot. He's got the guards. Complications. Every story has complications, okay? In the show I'm watching last night for too long, the long way around, Ian McGregor's trying to drive across the world, all around the world, and in Mongolia, they just don't have roads. And that's a complication when you're trying to get a motorcycle around the world, you know what I mean? Because you get stuck in a swamp, and every good story has complications. Now what the hero does, or the protagonist, may not be a hero, but the protagonist has to overcome those obstacles. And now let's talk about the word climax. What is the definition of the climax? Yes, ma'am, uh, Ada, Ida. You reach the peak of the strain. Let's see, let me say this. The peak of the intensity of the tension. It's the peak of the tension related to the dramatic question. Right? This is where it's like, I'm sorry if you haven't seen it, you need to see it, but I don't care. It's in the, um, the Empire Strikes Back. I mean, Luke is there and he's fighting Darth Vader and Darth Vader cuts off his hand and Luke is holding on and, and Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father. No! You search your feelings, you know it to be true. No! Join me and we will rule the universe. Bring order to the universe, which is another way of let's be Illinois fascist, right? But he's, he's got a choice, right? He can either commit suicide and jump or join his father and be evil. Man, that's the climax, and he jumps. Now, luckily, his friends are down there somehow. McKee, the guy that was in that video, who I see, he said that he, he committed suicide. I think he jumps knowing he can use the force to get him to a safe spot. But that's open for debate. Um, but the point is, the point at which they... Little Chinese, little Chinese guy's going to let the Doug out of the van because he gives him the money, right? And I'm um, in the hangover. And Doug! Ah, that's not our Doug. He's of a different skin color, right? And then they start talking about roofies and how they should be called floories, Right? And then the lone wolf, who's now part of the wolf pack, he realized, uh, roofies, right? And at the climactic moment, there, Dougie, I don't want to give it, how many of you have seen the hangover? You know what I'm talking about. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I didn't even see the third one. The second one, oh man, I read the best review of the third one. It said this, it said, this fecal Threequel. A, re a reviewer called it the fecal threequel. What is fecal? <laughs> Any what? What is it? Feces. That's right. I thought that was a. I haven't seen that one before. Oh, they're nitpicking here, aren't they? No, the fecal fecal. I didn't see it, so I didn't see the third one. Um, but the point is that the climax. The definition of the climax is what, ma'am? What is the definition of the climax? That's right. We want to know what's right at the edge. Where will we know whether it's going to turn out one way or the other? God, for me. Anybody see flight? Oh, man. And that bottle of vodka is on that mini fridge. Oh, I'm stopping. Or in...
in Lincoln when he almost gets the 13th Amendment? I can't tell you the end. No, no, never. <laughs> You'll want to see it. <laughs> but that moment, you know what I'm talking about? Where, where they go and find Andy Dufresne's cell, and Red is like, oh my gosh, I gave him that rope yesterday. And we don't know what happened to Andy, right? Can I give away the end? How many people have seen uh, the Sunset Redemption? <laughs> Okay, you know. And that's when the warden throws that rock through the picture of Raquel Wells. And then we go back and we see Andy Dufresne crawl through three football fields of the vilest smelling man known to man. And then he comes out, it's like birth. And it's raining and you got the God show. Yes! That's the climax, right? Where we get an answer to the dramatic question. Now we see him in the, the banks and he's withdrawing money and then he's... Then Red gets that postcard, and all right, we're set, right? And what's that? Then, after the climax, what do we have? Resolution, or denouement, where things return to normal, although changed, okay? Uh, again, the French call it denouement. If you're speaking American, you'd call it a denouement. But it's the resolution where we all go back to the Shire and we're drinking Dream Gale at the Green Dragon Inn. We're looking at each other knowing these people will never know what we went through. Right? Or when that plane takes off out of Iran. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Where she's laying in bed and she's like, and I had a dream and it was so real, but you were there and you were there and you were there, right? And Wizard of Oz, she's back to Kansas, but she's changed. She realizes she doesn't want to be over the rainbow. She realizes there's no place like home. And back in Los Angeles, when they're like, oh, they're like it's breakfast, and they're like, oh, there's more crumbs. We don't need breakfast. Okay, or in the Avengers, if you stay till after the credits, when they're all eating shmarma, whatever that is, and they're just sitting there eating. That's a good little scene, isn't it? They're, they're so tired, they're just like, oh man. That's great. It's denouement. Things return back to normal, be them changed. You are thinking dramatically. Now let's look at it in a model. And the word paradigm, P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M, you can think of a pair of dimes, is a model. And this is the dramatic model in a, a model form, obviously, right? Different way to view it. You have a will and want by a main character. Baby just wants to dance. And nobody puts baby in a corner. Uh, <laughs> dramatic question. It is... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether, whether the will and want... Good question, Summer. Excellent question. Dramatic question is whether the protagonist achieves their will or want or not. It's either answered yes or it's answered no. I mean, Tony Montana and Scarface, how does he wind up? No, I'm not going to give you the answer, but you know. The world is yours, right? Yeah, right. But, you know, that's a morality play. That's how it had to end. In Slumdog Millionaire, right? How does it, how, does the major dramatic question, does he win and get the girl or not, you know? The answer is the, uh, the major dramatic question. Is he going to get the money for who wants to be a millionaire and will he get the girl, kind of? Right? And sometimes you have parallel dramatic questions, all right? But very good question, Summer. You see that, then you guys are, are writing this model down on your page, right? Write this model down. It's in the book. All right. Redundancy's not bad. But, and you will talk about this on Friday, okay? So Andy Dufresne wants to be uh, free of his guilt and then free of the prison. It's inevitable he either is or isn't. Made a dramatic question, is he going to get out? He realizes, man, I got a lot of time here. I might be able to dig my way out, but we don't know that. Then we see his complications with the sisters, with the warden, which is being in prison, the hassles of it all. Um, at the climax, he's gone. And then we realize that he escaped. And then in resolution, Red gets out and Red joins uh, Mexico, uh, where Andy's working on that boat. <laughs> ah, retirement. I can't wait. My career goal. Now, uh, do you guys understand how in any story, and this can be a feature about Lance Armstrong. He's kind of had 
some difficulties lately. This can be a TV show, a Jersey Shore, right? Is Snooki going to wind up face first drunk at 11 in the morning in the sand, right? Are Ronnie and Sammy going to beat each other to death or will the cops be called, right? Um, uh, will, will the drag, will the dragons grow up? Right? Yeah. Will she, is she really going to trade the dragons for this, the, her biggest dragon for those? I know, but I can't be too, or if I'm too recent, you guys are going to throw rocks at me, okay? Yeah, I mean, how about the red wedding? Oh my goodness! Was that a shock? Ah, I'm not gonna tell you what's all I'll say about it. But so there it is in a dramatic form. Now you guys understand. You listen. We tell stories. I say in there, okay? Um, here, check this out for a second. I lost my car keys. No, I lost my house keys. I got locked out of my house. Is that a story? All right, now this may or may not have happened. One night in February, it's two in the morning, and I had a visitor. She was a very nice visitor, and she was at my house. And I went outside, and I took a broom, and I didn't have my jacket on or anything, and I was a gentleman. It was snowing really bad. It's two in the morning in February. So I brushed off her car as a gentleman, and she got in her car, and she drove off and waved. And then I turned around, and I saw that she had shut and locked my door. Oh, no keys. Oh, my goodness. What am I going to do? I'll call one of my friends. How many? I don't have my cell phone. I'll just use call their numbers on another phone. How many of you guys know your friend's phone numbers? Nobody. You know their name and you do it on auto dial. So there I am. It's freezing. It's like five degrees. It's snowing. I don't got a jacket on. Um... I'll walk to the hospital, because I'm right by Broman, actually. And I start walking, I'm like, well, who the heck am I going to call? Well, my baby's mama, she lives two more blocks. I'll go there and knock on that door at 2.30 in the morning. No, that's probably not a good idea either. So I walk back to my place, and I, I see that the people that live across the street, I don't know them, but I wave at them. Their lights are on. So I knock on the door, and they're like, Hey, dude, how you doing? What's up? Here. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. It's really good, man. No, 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 no. I went to SIU and get that out of my system, okay? But they're like, hey, what's up? I said, can I use your phone to call the cops to open my apartment? They're like, call the cops? No, man, you can't do that. <laughs> but you can call your landlord. Yes. The things that pop out of people's in when they're... <laughs> When they're relaxing and smoking the best weed in the Shire, right? And, and so I call First Sight, and the guy's like, he's like, in, in, I'll be there in 20 minutes, it'll cost you 25 bucks. All right, he comes up, opens it for me, I'm in my place, life is good. All right, do you see the difference between me telling the facts and me telling a story? Now, all that may or may not happen, okay? I don't want to go on the record on any of that. Right? But if somebody asked you the first time, has Mikhail ever lost his, his keys to his place? You would go, I don't know. But now, after I told you the story, can you, what if somebody said, did Mikhail ever lose his keys? What would you say? Yeah. And you know why you're going to remember? Because I told you a good story. So a story is not only informative... But it's also, and it's not, or it's not only entertaining, but it's also informative. And then it might serve, serve a sermonic function where it's persuasive. If you're going to go outside to sweep her snow off her car, dude, be a gentleman. But make sure she doesn't lock your freaking door, okay? You know what I'm saying? Uh, but, but, but you guys know, you see, we are storytelling and listening creatures. And it helps us remember, okay? That's why story is so important. Now, whenever you write a story, write down, you want to think about structural considerations in the story. Okay? Write that down. Structural considerations in the story. The first of these structural considerations is unity. What is unity? Yes, ma'am. Is everything related in the story? Does it all hang together? In my little story about the keys, was it all related together? 
close. And some of it, the fact that it was my baby's mama who I had... Yeah, you know, it was kind of for entertainment purposes, but it was true. No, it wasn't. I don't know if that's saying it was or wasn't. But yeah, it was like, oh, you can't go there at 3.30 knocking. Well, what were you doing outside your house? Uh, yeah, yeah, the mafia was there, and I was hijacked to Cuba, and, you know, I couldn't tell her that, well, ever. Did it all hold together? So that story pretty much held together. How was the variety? Did it have different elements? Did it, variety, would somebody def, define a variety for me? Yes, sir. So a change in the story. Could be music, could be characters, could be who you're quoting. It could be a different statistic. It's just a change in the story. That is variety. What is pace? Yes. The speed at which it moves. You guys ever see a Corona ad? Corona. They're on the beach, and then they move the bottle, and then you see Dr. McHale in a Speedo, and they, and they move the bottle back so you don't see it anymore. Thank the Lord, you know. But what's the pace of a Corona ad? Why is it slow? Because it's relaxing. As opposed to a Jimmy John ad, and what's the speed of a Jimmy John ad? Fast. Why is the Jimmy John's ad fast? Because they want you to know that you're going to get it really quick. You're going to get they won't deliver it before you have to hang up the phone, right? So pace needs to be appropriate for the message. Then finally, what is this last thing? Climax. And what is climax? <laughs> it's what? Yes, ma'am. Wait, this ma'am. What is climax? The point at which the dramatic tension is the greatest. That's right. And that leads right back to storytelling, doesn't it? So we know structural considerations. We'll continue to talk about these. Go to the next slide for us. Go, yeah, just go blaze through them. We talked about unity, variety, pace, climax. So in, in essence, what I'm saying, don't take, whatever you write, this is a t number 12 on the test. No matter what you write, you should think of how you could possibly write it as a story. You understand? Or have a climax. Even, even ads that have a joke, the punchline is the climax. Okay? So that question is true or false. No matter what you write, you should consider having a climax in your media message. Is that true? That is true. I'm giving you the answer right now. I'm not, I'm giving it to you. The answer is true. No matter what you write, always consider having a climax. Uh, no, 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 let you, no, go blaze all the way to the end. Um, I am not going to always cover everything in the book. You have it, right? You have the book. Do I expect that you read it? I demand it. We talked about thinking dramatically. We talked about structural considerations. And I'm telling you, in 50 years, when you wire the message right into the frontal cortex, tell them a good story. I don't care if you're writing for print, radio news, television news, public relations, television entertainment feature films. Tell them a story. Now wait, wait. I need you to look at the syllabus, bring the syllabus, know about the syllabus for Friday, and then, wait, come on, please, on Monday, I need you to read chapter two, which is on theoretical considerations for mass media writers. You guys have a great week. Welcome to our first week. This is, hey, hold on just a second. This, we're again taking more steps as we think dramatically, thinking like dramatists to become the best mass media writers we can be. Thank you. Rock.